Hello everyone, welcome to Ruckus. I'm so glad you're joining me for another week of our Christmas series called The Gift. This is a series where we look at attributes or things that were going on when Jesus arrived on the scene, which is a good way for us to take time to remember that even though Christmas is busy and we have lots of fun things happening, to take time to remember that Christmas is really a time to celebrate the day, the moment that Jesus arrived on earth, fully man, fully God, to begin, or fully baby, I guess, Um, but fully human, fully God, to, to take on the mission of paying the price for our sins, to redeem his people back to himself. And, and that's something we can be very, very thankful for. Back when Jesus arrived, the Israelites, or the Jewish people, were um, ruled by the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire had a lot of rules, a lot of laws, and a lot of ways of governing that were pretty brutal. They taxed their, their subjects quite a bit. They would punish a lot of people who were out of line in pretty harsh ways. They were a a bit of a a scary nation, and the reason why they were able to take over so much of the world is they were efficient at, well, to be quite frank, killing people. And they were efficient at subjugating people and keeping them down, but they were also efficient at building roads and building lines of communication and all these other things. And that all took money and, and keeping people in line, and they were really good at keeping people in line. Well, the Israelites were waiting for a king to come. They were waiting for a Messiah who was going to prepare the way, who was going to, not just prepare the way, who was going to turn everything on its head and and bring everything back and, and reissue or restart the kingdom that God had already once established. That's what they were waiting for. They were waiting for the new kingdom of God to come. Well, they had all heard the reading that we read last week, our core passage, which is found in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And this was a well-known passage then, well-known as something that that they were looking forward to, and and it's something that we read every year. And let's read it again and think about what kind of ruler, Messiah, Savior, King, were does this passage describe? Just think about the ways that this Messiah is described and think about how a first century person might hear this passage from Isaiah and and how they would respond to it. Let's check it out. Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, everlasting father prince of peace of the greatness of the of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on david's throne over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and for and time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this Okay, so in the first century, the Israelites or the Jewish people were oppressed and subjugated by the Roman Empire, and everyone was anxiously awaiting a Messiah. But no one could really agree on what this Messiah was going to be like. Some figured that he'd have to be a very mighty king to defeat the Romans. Others figured the Romans weren't the biggest problem, and that without the Romans, they would have sickness and death all over the place. So the the uh, the Messiah would have to be a very powerful angel. Others thought that that the Messiah would have to be very rich so that he could help the less fortunate. Others thought that because Isaiah said the Messiah would be mighty God, that one day the skies were going to split open and God was going to descend in some sort of crazy chariot and there was going to be no doubt because he was just going to show up in this amazing, powerful, um, visual way and everyone was going to know the Messiah had arrived. And others thought, well, no, the, the Messiah is going to arrive just like any other person, just like any other king is born to a royal family in a palace. The only thing people could really agree on about the Messiah was that the Messiah was going to come soon. And they were right. 
Because if you remember last week, we talked about how John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the Messiah, to prepare the way for Jesus' arrival and ministry. Well, before John the Baptist was born, an angel appeared to a young woman named Mary. And he told her that she was going to have a son. And that this son was to be named Jesus and that he was going to be the Savior, the Messiah. Well, an angel also appeared to Joseph, who was her, well, in modern terms, fiancé, and had a message for him as well. Let's read what the angel said to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Matthew 1, verse 21 to 22. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save people, his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. So when the angel appeared to Joseph, he said that Mary was going to have a son who was going to be named Jesus. Now this name is a very important name. Obviously, we know that Jesus' name is important. But it's important not just because that's his name. It's important because of what his name means. In, in, uh, in Hebrew... Jesus is translated to Yeshua. So just, just to get it, get it straight, Jesus is the Greek version of the name Yeshua. And the English version of both of those would be Joshua. Uh, and so the name Yeshua literally means that the Lord is salvation. Or if we were to use God's name, that Yahweh is salvation. So in this message that Joseph receives, that Mary has received, when it says that, that they're going to have a son and name him Jesus and he is going to be the Savior, this is no ordinary boy being named Joshua. This is literally the Lord coming as salvation. This is an amazing thing that is said to to Joseph that this baby is going to be God's son and he is going to be the Savior, the Messiah, who they've been waiting for for a long, long time. Well, just like Isaiah made prophecies and uh, about who the Messiah was going to be or, or different characteristics of the Messiah, another prophet named Micah made prophecies about the Messiah as well. And let's read one of his prophecies found in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be the ruler, who will be ruler over Israel, though whose origins are from old, from of old ancient times. So in this little prophecy, there's a few things that are that are really important details. The first one, which we'll get to in a second, is that the Messiah is going to be born in a town called Bethlehem. We'll get to why that's a big deal in just a second. But the other one is this, this other very important thing. It says that the origins of the Messiah are going to be from old, from ancient times which means this Messiah is not coming from, he's not going to be brand new. This Messiah is from time past. And in fact, we know that this Messiah is from eternity past, meaning that the Messiah is God. So even in this passage, there's an indication of the fact that the Messiah is going to be God himself. And that's an amazing little detail that people tend to miss because they focus on the first one, which now we're going to turn to, that, that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. That seems pretty simple to fulfill. There's people that live in Bethlehem. One of them is eventually going to be the Messiah. Well, here's the problem. Mary and Joseph didn't live in Bethlehem. So they've had a message that God is going to... Um, is going to, or that the, the Messiah is going to be born from Mary and that the Messiah is going to be named Jesus. The, the Lord saves and, and, he's, and we have this indication that he's going to be God. We have all these things, but the Messiah has to be from Bethlehem. Well, let's now look at Luke chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 to find out how 
it was possible or how Jesus came to be born in Bethlehem. Luke 2, verse 1 to 5. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken from the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to tell the their own town to register. So Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to do Judea, Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Okay, so Caesar has called a census, and so Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem. Well, a good question to ask is why? Do they have to go to Bethlehem? Well, it's because Caesar called the census and required that all the end, all the people go back to the, the place of their ancestors, where their people come from. It'd be almost like, um, it'd be hard because, um, you know, I'm, my, my grandparents, some of them were from England, some of them were from Hungary, and some of them were born here. It'd be hard to figure it all out, but I'd have to go back to somewhere in Europe to go back to the place of my ancestors, or even further when you, when you go even further back. Either way, they had to go back here, and this was no short trip. This would have been at least a three-day journey. And can you picture how it's usually depicted in movies or TV shows or, or in Christmas pageants or on Christmas cards? Usually Mary's riding on a donkey and Joseph's leading her. Well, the truth is, is that the Bible never says that. And in fact, it was fairly uncommon for that to happen. And in fact, in some places in the world, they don't even add that to, to their story because it's just not something that they would understand would ever happen. It's entirely likely that Mary had to walk the whole way. It's not, it's not guaranteed that that's what had to happen, but it's, enti- it's very possible that she had to wa- walk at least a decent part of this journey. And she was almost ready to give birth, which for anyone who, for any woman who's been pregnant, they would know, your, your, your moms would know, that when you're that far along, it is hard to move around. Our son Kyson was born in October, but in the summer, in July, Melissa and I decided that we we're going to take Ray and bring her to her grandparents, and we were going to go for a walk. We used to like to hike all the time, and we don't get much time to do it now, but we decided we were just going to go for a nice, leisurely walk in nature. So we drove into a park in Vancouver called Pacific Spirit Park. It's really big. And when we were at the trailhead, we read one of the trails, and, and we saw that it was it was about an hour and a half walk, and we thought, that's decent. We don't want to be gone all day. We'll, we'll go for a walk, then we'll go uh, and, and go out for lunch and, and have a good afternoon, and then we'll go pick up Ray. So we started walking down this trail towards where we, where we thought this trail was. And we were right. This is where the trail was, but we had misread the sign. The sign didn't say that it was an hour and a half from the point where we were at. It was an hour and a half at the start of another trail that was quite far away. So as we were walking, we walked over terrain that wasn't that hard to walk on, but there was a lot of uphill and downhill and and twists and turns. And Melissa got very, very uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, long story short, we never got to that actual trail because it was so far away. And Melissa was getting more and more uncomfortable. She was having to take breaks, getting out of breath, having Braxton Hicks contractions, which are uh, normal, but they, they get triggered more the more you move. And, and she, was, she was having a hard time. She was very, very uncomfortable. Now, she was nowhere near ready to give birth yet. And here Mary is very, very close. And she's having to do this long journey. It was going to be very, very difficult. And to make matters worse, they arrive in Bethlehem and it must have just been busy with all these people arriving for this, this census because they, they, they arrive and, and there's people everywhere. And let's read what happens next from Luke chapter 2, verses 6 to 7. Luke 2, verse 6 to 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn a son she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them so that that verse probably brought to you some more images that are familiar at christmas time but let's just kind of break those images a little bit 
One is, is that this likely wasn't an ancient hotel that they were turned away from. It was likely a relative's guest room. Back then they would have a guest room made up for people who came from out of town as a way to show hospitality, which was very important to them. My parents have a guest room in their house. And in fact, as I dropped my daughter off there this morning for them to spend some time with her, they had a couple of people, a couple of relatives staying in their guest room. This was a common thing for my parents and it's a common thing uh, in, in this era for people to have these guest rooms. Not so common for a lot of people today, but it was at one point very common. Anyway, the next part is when we hear stable, we usually think of a small barn or something. It likely wasn't a small barn. It was either uh, a cave in, in the side of the hill that would have been in the back of their property that would have had some sort of a, a door on it to protect the animals from the elements and also from robbers and and wild animals and that kind of thing. Or it was the lower part of the house, which was also very common. The lower floor would be the place where the animals were kept. So either way, Jesus was born in a less than ideal place. Today, kids are usually born in hospitals or in people's homes, in clean, safe environments. Back and and in this instance, Jesus is born in a in a place that probably wouldn't have been the first choice then either. He's born surrounded by animals, which bring with them sometimes parasites, fleas, and different things like that. But they also leave their waste lying around everywhere. He was born in a dirty, unsanitary place, um, and also placed in a manger, which is just a feeding trough. So that's the place where the animals will go to get their food. That's where he's placed which is also probably not a very sanitary place for a baby to be put. Why would he have been born in this way? This flies in the face of anything that people thought about the Messiah. They thought he was going to be born in a palace or he was going to come out of heaven like, 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 a, like an angel, as an angel or as mighty God, and he was going to come down. Either way, they did not expect the Messiah to come this way, but I think there's an important reason why the Messiah came this way. And it's because... Jesus isn't just for elite people, people of noble birth, rich people, royalty, or anything like that. Jesus is for people from all levels of society, from all nations, from all races, basically people who have, have come to Christ from all sorts of different backgrounds, not just one type of background. The church is made up of people from all sorts of backgrounds that come together centered around who Jesus is, centered around what he is has done. And that's important. Today, a lot of people have their views about how Jesus should be. Some people think Jesus should just give them things because they've been good. Other people view Jesus, especially at Christmas time, as a sweet little baby sitting in a manger, like in those cute um, nativity scenes that we set up every year. And it's so easy to forget something so important, that that little baby didn't just come to this earth to stay a baby. He grew into a man who lived a life and understood what suffering was, understood what it was to struggle and all these different things. And then he willingly went to the cross to pay the price for our sins so that we could be brought into God's family. So what is enacted at Christmas time is God becoming humanity and then enacting his plan to redeem us and bring him back into his family. So as you go throughout your week this week, as you prepare for Christmas, don't worry so much about the gifts that you're gonna get, but take time to remember that Christmas is not about just baby Jesus staying in the manger, although that's part of it. It's about the fact that he grew into a man and willingly laid down his life in our place. And that, is very, very good news. All right, everyone, thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.